Okay, we're back live at Strata. We are in the afternoon program here at theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's uh, flagship telecast where we go out to the top events in tech and explore and get the signal from the noise, extract that and share that with you. We're all about knowledge and, and pushing it out to the social streams. Thank you for watching. I'm here with uh, Jeff Kelly, who's subbing in for Dave Vellante, who had to take a bio break, because you know what, we go all day long. I take a break, Dave takes a break, but you know what, we go all, as, much as, we, as long as we can to get as much content as possible. And uh, again, extract the signal from the noise and do independent quality analysis. And we're joined here with Virginia Carlson, who's from Chicago, Metropolitan Chicago Information Center. Center. You guys are a nonprofit, mm -hmm. uh, and you do a lot of work with data, so first, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank and you. And let's talk here. about data. So tell us data. your impressions of Strata, and what's going on in the data world from your angle? Well, this is my second time at Strata. I was here last year, and as I think a lot of people felt last year, it was so good to be together with the tribe where you can sit down and all, um, almost immediately get into a conversation about sort of, you know, uh, universe versus sampling and you know, everyone on the table understands what you're talking about. So it's fabulous to be here and um, it's meeting so many people from so many And the so tribe is growing too, the right? Tribe, and yeah. the tribe is growing and it's mainstream. We're seeing articles in the New York Times, right. Wall Street right. Journal, talking right. about big data. Right. Um, we publish on Forbes at SiliconANGLE. I have a, I'm a contributor on Forbes.com. They have a big data-driven section. O'Reilly also contributes there. Mm -hmm. Great group of people, but now the tribe is growing. Data is now a force. It's a business model. What's happening? I mean, what's old and what's new? Because there's all this sure. talk about data warehousing, business intelligence, same story, new wine, different bottle, kind of whatever <laughs> the metaphor you want to use, but we're seeing new trends like predictive analytics and real time or whatever that means on whatever parsed definition. So right, what's right. your angle on this? Well, where are we? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about where we sit. The MCIC, Metro Chicago Information Center, sits uh, as a sort of funnel between big data uh, and historical big data and the common good, public good organizations on the ground that would have needed those data, that still need those data. Um, for example, anything from a local American Indian healthcare center that needs to understand where to open a new clinic to a larger uh, philanthropic organization like the MacArthur Foundation who wants to know whether or not its local community efforts are making a difference. So we try to do that date, what we call the data intermediary piece, curate the data, analyze it, visualize it, give them the findings. You know, the data of the tribe, I love the tribe analogy because yeah, that was yeah. obviously Mark Pincus' failed startup with yeah. my friend Paul Martino and then now he's doing Zynga, big data company. But, but the tribe in this data world that we're living in, um, Jeff Hammerbacher from Cloudera when he was on theCUBE mm -hmm. talked about that Hadoop world because uh, he was a, a, a baseball star. He said, data scientists are like gym rats. They're, like, they're, they're out there. They do it because they love it. So, you know, you know in the early days in, in this open data market, you got to go find data sources. So tell us um, from your perspective, because you have to go out and scour sources, find sources, right. because right. It's all, that's, that's, the, that's the drug. You need source of data. So tell us, what's it like out there? How did you find sources? Are they rolling in now? Is there, inter is there intermediaries? That you, are you brokering the data? Are you a data broker? Wait, wait, how does someone get sources? And what's right. scrappiness you right. need? Right. You need right. street smarts, you need? Well, for the historical perspective, you know, we were founded 22 years ago to do 3,000 household survey uh, projects every year because there wasn't enough data to do local planning and policy development. That went away in 2002 as more administrative and operational data became available from governments uh, and as uh, there was less, but worse response rates from surveys basically. So turning to open data and sources at that point, 2002, you had to FOIA most of it. Now there's the big open government movement and now, you know, sort of folks selling their souls, if you will, selling their, their, their private data to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all the rest of that. So from our perspective, big data is, I want to say a double-edged sword, but it may be a single-edged sword, and that as, as more and more data are collected by private sector companies, there is less available data for social service organizations that need public data to do public planning. So are you saying there's data hoarding going on? Are people hoarding the data? Are they want to just control it? 
Uh, it should I, be a I show called use, Data Hoarders. <laughs> That's actually a good cable show. We should run that. Data Hoarders. You know. Data Hoarders. Facebook, yeah. you're hoarding data. data. You know, I mean, that's their business model. They need to monetize. What they're doing is selling you back your own data in the form of services and advertisements, and that's that's how they, they're making money. But what it's doing is it's, it's, it's sort of... Um, choking. It, choking, there's a good word. Other sources of data that people might use um, that might be more public, less confidential, and that dries things up for us. And, and, and the OpenGov movement in particular is is all about getting operational and administrative data from the federal and local governments and what I mean by that is you know how do we fix potholes and who are our lobbyists and all the rest of that and what's being ignored is the federal statistical system the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau who have historically uh, done the data collected the data that local planning organizations need now as, as are they making that available or is it just Locked it's in. just it's the budgets being cut as as the uh, federal government is moving towards open data initiatives and and you know folks um, that are here are really working hard to get transparency from government the federal government in particular is sort of saying okay that's where we're going we're not going to be doing our statistical collections so what's the trend line then is it positive negative I mean is, is it going in the right direction I'm trying to understand how the government is, is working here. Because I'm not a big, again, self-confessed, uh, right. I'm not a right. big guru right. on right. what's going on in, in Gov 2.0, whatever they call it these days. But, you know, to me, data should be available. Right. right. It should be readily available. Right. Are we seeing positive trends or negative trends relative to the government? It sounds negative to me. Well, there's 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 different kinds of government data. And I think that 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 difference has not been recognized by the o open gov movement itself so it's positive on the one hand and negative on the other uh, it's positive for open gov people uh certainly you know um from a visibility standpoint from a visibility rhetoric standpoint, standpoint the usa it, spending yeah, rah, rah. all the rest of that and all yeah, the rest go. of that there's golf the, clap as they say but you know clap. you need the data right i mean if Right. You need the data. There's there's calls for the data. We certainly have lots more at the municipal level as well as the federal level than we did 10 years ago. But what the Gov 2.0 folks don't understand is that there's been historical, statistical, what census director calls design data collected for hundreds of years that's been used for local planning. And the more that the open Gov uh, community pushes for transparency in administrative and operational data, the less the government is doing on the statistical side. And that's that's sort of a, it's a geeky difference, but it's really important to the folks that we work with. Because if we don't have census data that tell us who is poor at the census tract level, um, having access to like who's lobbying the federal government is not doing us any good. So how does someone get involved, the average person who cares about this? Because there are a lot of people who do care. There's a whole new generation of Americans, quite frankly, who and people yes. from non-Americans yes. around the world, yes. the global economy, right. who want to have a data. With big data, we can actually instrument society. So right. Right. that's a good right. thing. So right. we talked about that on theCUBE last night. So how does someone get involved, a listener out there, a reader, a watcher, a viewer of us, how do they get involved? Well, I'd like, you know, what Drew, uh, or I'm sorry, Jake Porway and, and I are ha having a session tomorrow about, and what I'd like to, the conversation we'd like to start, and I would like to start is, okay, if, 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 if so much data is being made private, confidential, folks are giving away their data to, to Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the, the, the sort, of, sort of big three, how can those data be used for, a so, for, the, for social good? Target big story in the New York Times. What if we could get that same target uh, profile and help a federally qualified healthcare center target that woman and say, okay, here's where you need to go to get your prenatal care. For, for example, what if we could get uh, Google search results on folks in different census tracts and how what they're looking for as their vision is fading and use that to help the centers for, uh, you know, Guild for the Blind figure out what sorts of vision impairments are going on. Yeah. So so my, my call and the conversation that needs to happen is with privacy and confidentiality, how can we get the private sector data into the hands of local people trying to work on common good uh, problems? Well, let's explore that a little bit. What what responsibility do you think companies like Facebook have, and 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 how do we get to that point? How do we get them to uh, 
companies like that to share that data, to make it available, um, what role do they have to play? And what would your message be to them if they're watching right now? Well, my dream would be that they would uh, see this as a philanthropic uh, opportunity. There are other ways to do that. A, a number of them have have sort of a philanthropic arm where they'll lend out their data scientists for problems. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to suggest to them that their, their data is just as, as uh, valuable as the skills the data scientists have. And we should begin a conversation around how and in what, under what conditions privacy and confidentiality can be preserved at the same time that they start thinking about uh, you know, sort of how letting the letting the data free i mean if data wants to be free as they say um let's let's use it for for public good i don't yeah virginia thanks for coming inside thanks. the cube we personally have uh care about this society benefit ben, uh, benefit um you know dave and i were talking last night uh, around how society can benefit from big data the stuff that you're doing in your work is phenomenal it's exactly the kind of use cases that the I call commercial vendors, don't necessarily talk because they're not in that business of actually helping human beings, but the, in the healthcare example and or doing planning around making society a better mm -hmm, place, mm -hmm. big data can completely streamline and make so much more operational efficiency around stuff that's already existing, that data. So I personally believe in what you're doing. Thank you for sharing Thanks. with us. For um, keep in touch with us. Let us know how okay. we can get a hold of you because mm -hmm. uh, we want to promote your work and, and conversations. Good and bad. We'll, we'd love to hear them all. Gov 2.0, to me, I think that's more rah-rah political stuff, but I want to see use cases like you're talking about where real applied data to really help people mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the government's spending money to help people. Right. <laughs> so it's right. Like, that's like the job, right? right? So like, you know, there's no, you know, if you can monitor that and instrument it in real time, that's a good thing. So I'm for it. Uh, I don't know if that's a libertarian view or whatever. I don't know. I just like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'll be right back. And uh, we would not be able to bring this great content if it wasn't for our ad-supported partners, Cloudera, MapR, Digital Reasoning, 1010 Data. Thank you very much to those vendors. Folks, watch the ads because those are the guys who would make it possible for us to bring this great content to you. Uh, Virginia's doing some great work. Thank you very much. And we'll Thanks. be right back.